All right, we'll, we'll continue right away uh, because this is really not a different session. It just continues the same um, challenges. Have a seat, thanks. Um, the only difference is we will now look a bit into the future, um, the future of art science collaboration. Um, and uh, before we do that, let's just um, introduce our new panelists. We have Spela Petric here and Miha Tursic, who um, are currently showing a piece in the Ars Electronica Center in the Biolab. Um, they weren't there this morning when I tried to find them, but they, they promised me to be there when you are coming. So um, We have Anna here still from the, uh, the panel because she has a double role. She's sort of, the, she's, she's ensuring continuity uh, in, in, this, in, in this project. Um, Ingeborg Reichle, as a professor um, of media theory, has been looking into this uh, art science collaborations for a very long time. Um, and Mark Huckelberg, who is um, a professor, he's a, a rare species of a philosopher, I should say. He's a philosopher of technology, of which there are not so many, maybe increasingly so. Um, before we start, I'd, I'd probably like to ask um, Spela and Miha, because you are the artists, so you deserve uh, to speak up first. Um, Tell us a bit about your experience, and maybe you can put this in the larger context of art science collaboration in general. How would you assess the current state of play in this field? There's a mic over there. I don't know who it yeah. um, <laughs> I mean, our project was really about re-questioning the field between art and science as two very strong domains of human knowledge. Um, and we understand, I mean, from previous experiences, we understand that this is really a field of negotiations, conflicts, if you want. Uh, but at the end, uh, also a lot of pleasure, because you always find uh, the mutual ground, in spite very different type of, of the character of uh, work of the scientists or, or, or the artists because we find that uh, we serve each other as extension of uh, our methods and that uh, there's always this mutuality because we all share the same topics um, and that's why I mean through our project we literally researched uh, the, the field of s multiplicity of observations. There, is, there are scientists who have a s very special methods of observation, uh, but on the same topic, our topic was uh, were the supercomputers, uh, we can use the same technology for different kind of observation, uh, especially because these supercomputers are used for to observe ourselves, to understand human body, uh, human environment, uh, technology that we are producing, uh, but actually we could add a new perspectives to the same topic. Uh, and that's why they accepted our view and we accepted their view in the context of this multiplicity of perspectives. And that's why it was really a pleasure to, to, to combine all of that. Well, I'll ask Spela because how would you assess the current situation and, and um, of art science collaboration? So, I would say obviously there are a lot of opportunities. After all, we are continuously working in this field, uh, not having um, other jobs. So, it's opening up. Um, I think in a way, um, leaving it. And I think we discussed this last year already in the panel, such as this one. Uh, art and science is not enough. We should probably widen the scope of interdisciplinary collaborations to uh, involve humanities as well. Um, actually, at the moment, we're also uh, working towards um, allowing or enabling through the artistic practice um, scholars in humanities 
uh, to also engage in practical research, which could feedback into humanities itself. So there's, I, I think the, the whole uh, art science practice needs to open uh, even more to other disciplines. It will be beneficial for all of us. Of course, funding is always an issue. Um, but I think increasingly with, with different schemas like this where uh, the funding is actually uh, longer term, and implicates these different fields in the same research project. So you're no longer, you no longer have this artist knocking on scientists' doors, but it's like a common project. Uh, this would be very, very conducive uh, to great artworks and probably uh, a lot of development also in the field of sciences and humanities because of this continuous um, collaboration um, and, and yeah, feedback. Uh, maybe we should say at this point that the one interesting thing about the FEET uh, initiative is that it's been funded by a technology initiative. So it's a, it's a science program, a science and technology program, uh, which in this case supports also the work of artists, and that is not common today. So it's not an artistic initiative. Um, same, I think, holds true for the STARTS initiative. Um, but um, uh, you, I think you mentioned artists knocking on the doors of scientists, but I think increasingly we also see scientists knocking at the doors of artists. Anna, can you tell us a little bit about future plans of yours in, um, I think you, are, you will be involved in larger scale initiatives if, if, I'm, if I'm not saying too much or... Or do you do you have occasionally <laughs> scientists working, um, you know, asking you to work with them, or is it oh, always yeah, yeah, the I other get, way around? Yeah, I've been invited into quite a few projects, um, and I mean, with the latest thing that I've been working on with this Beyond Seek consortium, I know we're trying to develop that into further routes. So we're putting in some other grant ap applications. And I was asked to be involved in the, um, I mentioned in talking about earlier with the grant applications and being put in. Um, I'm put into the Cryptic project, which is this massive um, worldwide project to um, look at um, diagnostics and drug resistance in tuberculosis. It's a big Gates Foundation and Medical Research Council, things like that. So I'm continuously kind of working on, on these things. Um, I think it's very important for the artist to be kind of embedded and working with the scientists over a, a long period of time. And then that way, also scientists introduce you to other scientists and they invite you places. So that's a really nice, like, kind of way that it can work. I think one, one thing we realized when studying the way feet worked, um, that you not just have this, you know, project as like a one-of-a-kind collaboration, but you're actually establishing and creating networks yeah. which are quite durable. They, yeah. they persist much beyond uh, the time of the project, really. Yeah, I mean, they will always continue. It's, it's, it's almost unheard of that I don't continue a collaboration. So I have this, like, group of scientists now that I kind of, they're interthreaded, and they all start kind of getting to know each other as well. So that's where it's quite interesting. I've got, like, researchers in Oxford working with the researchers in Birmingham and, and stuff in different countries and sending bacteria from this part of the world to this part of the world. <laughs> Okay. Ingeborg, I'd, I'd like to, to ask you again this question. Um, when you looking back um, look at the history of art science collaboration and, and taking a view of what's, where, where are we now? I mean, here, of course, in Ars Electronica, we are sort of talking, preaching to the converted. Mm -hmm. um, but that's probably not the case for a really broad, uh, neither the art world nor the science world. But how would you assess the situation today? Well, I think today the situation is much better than, say, 10 or 20 years ago. So I think the, the, the challenge was, during the 20th century, getting access, the challenge for the artist, getting access. Um, but I think a lot of uh, um, science institution, uh, institutions, through their um, development, um, like Science Goes Public, this were not only the scientific institutions, but also the science museums, for example, 
um, they opened up the doors um, for, for artists, but also for people from the humanities and philosophy. Um, and I think there are two developments um, you can see in the last 10, 15 years is that uh, the curricula at art schools changed a lot and there is um, DIY um, open science. and. Um, some scientific tools uh, are still extremely expensive and you need you know extremely qualified people and the um, technology and software you use is very ex expensive but there are other fields in the sciences um, you can um, you can easily today buy uh, a lab in your kitchen for a couple of thousand uh, dollars. So these are two things um, that I guess are uh, quite different now. The, and, and, and I think the situation, uh, um, especially for the younger artists who are already trained in art school, like we have a master degree, for example, in, in Vienna on art and science. Um, they are already trained to speak to scientists. Scientists are invited to art schools. So I think um, in general, the situation is, uh, is better than it was, say, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, before we return to the question of curricula, which I think is an interesting one, I'd like to ask Mark um, about, well, again, to assess the situation um, from the point of view of um, creation and creative processes. I think we discussed this a little bit before um, because, you know, you could argue from the point of philosophy, the difference between the artist and the science is really not so big. But then again, when you look at the communities, the practices, these are really different worlds still. Or are they coming together? How, how would you see that? I, I think there, there's still a, a lot of difference for most people, yeah? so most philosophers, most artists. But you're right that it's in principle, it's very easy to talk. There are a lot of artists, for example, who use theories from philosophy, concepts from philosophy. Um, so especially in that direction, I would say things are going well. The other direction, I think, people could learn more in philosophy from art. Um, but uh, I must say this is, yeah, in general, still easier than the, than the art science. And I would be particularly interested today to, to hear more um, why exactly what a scientist could, could learn from artists. Because like, the other way is, is pretty clear, I think. But the, what, could, what could the scientists learn from the artists? Because I heard a lot of collaborations that are already going on, so I'm happy to hear that. But I would like to know more what exactly motivates these scientists to, to um, ask the, the artists uh, and, and collaborate with the artists. Um, I will have to ask the, the artists. I can, I'd like to answer with one story, because obviously we also asked our um, our um, scientists in the projects, what, what they learned. And mm -hmm. apart from these additional questions they get, um, they seem to get liberty. They seem to get a moment of freedom to do things which they um, can no longer typically do in this following the strict project schedules they have. They are, they're all uh, wound up in this extremely, you know, uh, deliverable oriented way of producing scientific results um, almost like uh, on the assembly line, and the presence of artists gives them uh, freedom to to discuss things, to think about things, to do some crazier stuff which they would not usually do. I don't know whether the artists had one. Experience. Just very quickly, even yeah. in the humanities and the social sciences, there's also the assembly line pressure, yeah, for funding and so on. Okay. <laughs> I literally just want to defer the answer to this question to Claudia, who's actually recently interviewed several of the scientists that I collaborate with. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, I've, I've just been researching uh, in this field quite a lot, and I've been uh, accessing this, exactly this question on the one hand through interviews and ethnographical studies. Uh, but also uh, trying to look at it from, from different um, uh, social theoretical perspectives. So for example, this thing where you say about uh, the freedom, it, it's very much about this, um, when you bring in the artist, you, you create this extraordinary situation. So within anthropology and other social theories, you know this uh, theory of liminality, for example, <clears throat> 
where you create this, this free space where you are free for experimenting, being creative, doing things that are not bound to, to your other social structures that you're normally uh, bound to because it's something that's somehow connected to what you know, but it's disconnected to your respons responsibilities. And this is something where I think that uh, there is a lot of um, uh, positive uh, effects that such uh, art science residencies or, or collaborations can bring in also for the, art, uh, for the scientists so that they are able to experiment and, and think in new ways they wouldn't dare if they would only talk to their peers. And there's other things like I, I mentioned before, like this um, different aspects of, of sense making processes and so on, that they just learn to look at their own data in a different way and suddenly have to explain it to themselves in a new way. So this is also something that triggers new research questions and also new, new aspects for themselves. I don't know whether you can confirm this, but in our analysis it even appeared as if the artists and the scientists actually have a shared understanding in, in the sense that they are working towards the same goal, although they're actually really doing quite different things, but they have this feeling they are working on, on the same bigger question. Yes, this is something that I also uh, encounter quite often. Uh, and this is where, where I tried before when I said it, it's really different and it need, uh, in, in every single uh, residency or collaboration I encounter. In the beginning, there is a lot of, uh, yeah, people are hesitant and don't know if this is the case, but as soon as they recognize this is the case, they, they work together more freely. Um, there's <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, what about aesthetics? Because, I mean, you were mentioning before um, for the artists uh, you are collaborating with, it seems to be so important how some device looks like or something like this. And I think this is a, 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 an important question because aesthetics is the, um, is the expertise of artists. And I think this is also something beside the, the, the free space and the freedom being more creative than in other uh, contexts. Aesthetics would be an important uh, concept to, to talk about also. And maybe, maybe you could answer my question also. What, what, uh, what did this uh, mean for you when the artist said it's important how this device looks like and how it's designed? Do you find it important for your research? Uh, no, not so well. Not <laughs> okay. So this is just nonsense for you. Well, yes. I'm only with my, so, yeah, if I speak only with my scientist hat on, because I also like art, I love art, right. But if I forget about that, of course we do not care about the aesthetics. <laughs> right. Um, Mark, you wanted to come yeah, back the, uh, to previous, to previous response question. Response to what you said, that the goals are the same, but the means are different. I would say exactly the opposite. What I notice also here at Aus Electronica, but also in the labs, is that the, um, what's, what's the same is the common practice to work uh, with material things. So it's very material practice, working with these objects and instruments. And th that seems to be very similar. And then the, the goals that they have, they are formulated at least differently. So that, that's maybe also in the light of science and technology studies, maybe just something to consider. Can I just add to this? <laughs> I knew there would be contradiction. No, 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 I, I completely agree, actually. I don't think the goals are, are similar at all. Um, no, I forgot what I was going to say. You, uh, I'll pick it up later. OK, I can. <laughs> um, so for sure, there's a lot of, I mean, we do love each other, of course. <laughs> but there's a huge power play um, going on. And until we will have science and art as two separate domains, uh, this power play will still be in act. And what, if we really want to achieve something in so-called art and science or other, I call it a composite activities, we need a different institution. Not just projects, not just residences, not just uh, initiatives, but literally uh, 
uh, emancipated domain, emancipated institution with its own power play uh, that can, of course, uh, work or has shared interests with art and with the science, but until you don't separate from both of them, uh, you're, you are inside of their game. Of, I mean, the output is aesthetics. The output is a paper, if you want. It's uh, an application for the industry at the end. Uh, but since art and science is becoming more and more something new, a composite of, uh, of art and science and humanities, uh, it really requires own power play in this field. Yeah, but, but then I have to ask Bela, sorry. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's actually kind of adding to this. Uh, I kind of find, uh, I sense a, a, a violence of this generalization of art and science. Is there a possibility to start using different phrases that are not exclusive? I know many scientists, I used to be a scientist, and there is no real comparison uh, that you can immediately equate uh, this whole population under one like scientific hat because you have a scientific hat but you're never just a scientist and uh, actually it's kind of um, in these collaborations I think it's important to also break this uh, professional mold and it sometimes happens and it sometimes uh, actually uh, causes the people to withdraw uh, into their scientific hat. Yeah. But yeah, that, I think now we are really going towards what the future should bring, which is ex precisely what this panel should be about. Because I don't think that currently, but correct me if I'm wrong, that currently this is the understanding. Current, isn't, isn't it more, Anna, I have to ask you, um, isn't it more that the artists are often given a specific function in programs of that kind? I mean, in a lot of things, you're commissioned to make a new work that has an outcome, that has an exhibition coming up. So there's that kind of function. We're quite often described under the public engagement strategy. That happens. And I don't think that's a bad thing, because I feel quite strongly about bringing the wider public into debates around art and science. Um, and I think... Yeah, it, it kind of having an artist in, in, in a science setting, for instance, does create different dynamics and, and has different, different impacts. It also helps the scientists to think about the work from new perspectives and think about public engagement as well from new perspectives, think about the ethical implications of their work as well. So those things are kind of how it is now. I mean, it's not a bad situation. Um, I quite, I mean, I quite like that world. I like going into labs. I don't find them intimidating, really, I think. <laughs> What's the borderline where you feel instrumentalized? Oh, uh, I mean, that's more in the sort of art event type thing when you, do you I, people groan. Do you ever feel like you're the content for somebody's event and you're just there <laughs> and then that happens and then they don't care whether you were there or not? I mean, some, you know, in all sorts of events like that, you can feel like you were just shunted in for some content and they, I don't know how much they're, they're looking into what they're they're showing and, and things like that in some situations. And then there's this whole other side where there's very sensitive, very careful, long-term curation of work, and you have this wonderful, ongoing kind of curatorial relationship, which we kind of tried to bring out in the feet project as well, because although we didn't have a specific curator on it, we did work with Annick Bureau, who's in the front row here, who, um, who has that perspective and, and did wonderful podcast interviews with us and the detail of it and has written extensively about our kind of practices and working methods. And I have to say, my conversations with Annick have revealed things to me about what I'm doing in my work that I hadn't, that given me new perspectives. I think that sort of stuff's really important in something like this. That, that was actually a positive thing that the artists fed back to us was that you felt a sense of community in, within the frame of the project and 
that was not so much competition, but it was actually something very supportive because you, you sort of felt like targeting the same issue. Mark, I just want to come back to you because you mentioned something I found very interesting. You're saying there is also a lack in the humanities for, for this kind of um, interaction. So it's not just art science, it's uh, science philosophy, art philosophy. Can you say something about trends and, and what we would need in the future, also more practically? I mean, is it just, is it just a, a research and yet another research program? Um, no, I think more practically we need um, to have less this, this kind of output-oriented research, huh? that, that you always have to show something in the short term, also short term, uh, you need to show something, whether that's an, a text or whether it's a, a, a project or funding or the, uh, the deliverables in, in projects and so on. Th this really uh, hinders um, also philosophical thought and, and discussion because for that you need to be not all the time a, a manager. Uh, I feel the more I'm doing projects, the more I become a manager. And that really hinders me in finding sufficient space for philosophical thinking and discussion. And so I, just like the, 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 the scientists uh, ask for a bit more oxygen in a way, I would say that this is also necessary in the humanities and social sciences. Lucas, you want to step in? There's a question in the back, but go ahead. You thought I was going to say something, uh, Erik? <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for the really interesting discussion. Um, my question is really uh, flows very much from that last question. It's very specific. And outside of funding um, such multidisciplinary work, what other ways can um, uh, government agencies, uh, NGOs, infrastructure bodies, what, what role can they play in uh, leading the development of multidisciplinary art, science, humanities, or any, any kind of discipline projects? I ask this because I work for Nesta, um, the UK's uh, innovation uh, foundation that focuses on very much these themes. And so we're, we're asking ourselves this, this question, so how can you promote this, this kind of work? without necessarily funding it. <laughs> I, no, I want to second that because I'm, I'm a frequent advisor to technology policy makers. So what do we need? Do we need, um, as, as we said before, you said we need, need more uh, time to answer the question, but, but in practice, how do we achieve this? Let's come back to this one, I think Ingeborg, you talked about it. You talked about curricula. Is this, is this the way to go? I'm a bit skeptical. Do we need art science collaboration specialists? Is, is, isn't that weird? Uh, well, the thing is that w what we try to do in, in Vienna is doing the other way around, uh, inviting scientists um, like uh, René Schröder, who's a well-known Austrian scientist uh, in the field of uh, molecular biology, or uh, um, Robert Trappel from the field of uh, artificial intelligence. So what we try is bringing the science part into the art school to train people in, on the level of, um, of a bachelor level from the very beginning um, to get used to um, a cross-disciplinary conversation and not to be forced into a, a certain discipline and to be specialized. And I think this is a challenge um, in the sciences, also in the humanities, because uh, cross-disciplinary work, or what we said in earlier days, trans or interdisciplinary work is very, very important. And uh, to face global challenges, the only way to um, to at least come close uh, to solutions, or even to to be. Uh, able to frame the problems is only possible through collaboration and, and the field that we just described, the art and science collaboration that took place in the last 10, 20, 30 years, are uh, uh, very good models for for our curricula, um, because therefore we call it um, cross-disciplinary strategies and we use artistic strategies to start a conversation between art, science, philosophy, um, humanities, SDS studies, and so on and so forth, um, because we think that the future is probably cross-disciplinary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, d I just wanted to kind of answer that question as well, because from, from my perspective, there's always quite often, and, and Lucas was really trying to draw it out earlier, there's always this thing about what innovation did the artist bring to this situation? There's always this rhetoric. And I've been incredibly skeptical about this, and this, I see this as a bit of a red herring, actually, to most of the time. And I think the people are, yeah, the, the, the most important thing to come out of an art science collaboration for me is a work of art, is a good work of art. And that's what my main goal is. But this kind of innovation y type thing, um, I'm very, very skeptical of. But what I found recently is it started to happen to me a bit. And I've obviously been doing this for years. Um, I'm, I'm going to say, very, very old now. Um, and I've, I've been working hands-on with scientists um, in labs um, for a very long time. And I, so what I realized was that maybe it just takes, and I'm going to swear because I'm English, just bloody years to um, actually kind of crack this. So, so when you have these things, you might get a lucky break where an artist kind of triggers something. But to actually nurture that, you need to kind of support from maybe the beginning right the way through. So there's a kind of, there's, there's a way of supporting um, artists who've been working a longer time in the field as well. Because there's quite a thing of like, oh, we've got a new residency program, we'll have these new people doing this, this certain thing or something. But what about people with this long trajectory? And it's really nice to kind of support all those levels as well from the beginning all the way through, I think. Yeah, and then without the pressure of you needing to produce that innovation, probably. Yeah, so that's, absolutely. Yeah, I don't that's, think that's, that's... that freedom. I was listening also to Mark, and um, before we started this, I had this also this idea of uh, ticking deliverables boxes. And uh, in a way, if we want this to progress, maybe for next, week, next year here at Ars Electronica, we should do a workshop on um, how to design with artists and scientists and maybe others, a new funding application format for art and science uh, collaborations for the European Commission. What I observe <clears throat> um, now that I'm doing um, EU-funded projects since a few years, and I'm very happy because I think there's also very many good things happening, so it's, it's not only a critique. But I used to be also in an uh, arts funding body as a, an advisor to um, say yes and no to certain applications. That was for, for the Mondrian Foundation in the Netherlands. And what you could do there is simply hand in whatever application as artist or arts institution, how you liked it. So no pre-given format, no pre-given communication plan, etc., etc. So it was entirely um, uh, evaluated on its own merit. And in a way, I feel a lot of um, hunger and eagerness for getting a bit more freedom in that and not making those applications where you have to have a, a huge dissemination program around it and almost spending more time on that than doing the core work that you are good in yourself. Maybe that, that could be something we can take further. Yeah. I would say if we're talking about a concrete process, then I think the reviewers are also important. So if you have an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary project, and then you always get this one of the three reviewers, for example, is always this very disciplinary person who, who then says, you know, it doesn't really understand that you're trying to, to break up the method or combine and so on. And so this is also important, I think, as part. Yeah, it's, it's a, a comment uh, to Lucas because I think it's a very important topic you bring up because talking about the, the funding and the funding bodies is of course not that sexy but it's very important because you know like in, in Austria we have the peak projects where you can um, try to get money for artistic research. The whole debate about artistic research was um, um, somehow also combined to the idea of collaboration between art and science and of course the, 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 the framing 
thinking of the funding bodies is still, I wouldn't say, uh, very, um, very stiff. And I think there is exactly, exactly what you just uh, said is, is true. It should be more, I wouldn't say natural, but it should be more easy to 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 get a kind of um, you know playground to to produce uh, whatever you want, art, science, or artistic research. And, but the disciplines are still, or the idea of uh, doing research in a certain disciplines is still very strong, although we all know that this is not the future. Yeah, uh, this is also something I experienced myself and I've been talking a lot with uh, funding institutions because if you want to, for example, include uh, artists in a scientific uh, project, it's really difficult for them to evaluate this project because you, you have peer review and then there is a, a reviewer who says, okay, there is a part of the project I cannot evaluate and I don't know if it's, if it's really good, if it's something uh, uh, that's worth doing if if the artist is capable in doing this what what you are proposing so they really have troubles how to reframe these um, uh, these new formats or, or these these funding formats in order to be able to incorporate um, uh, artistic uh, collaboration and it's not only artistic collaboration I experienced this a lot also with interdisciplinary collaboration so if you have uh, very interdisciplinary interdisciplinary projects it's also very difficult for reviewers to evaluate and then they rather say oh it's maybe you uh, you don't do it or, or they don't say it's an excellent proposal so it's not part of the pool that finally is probably getting a funding so this is really difficult but this is something that needs to be solved more generally it's it's the funding system and, and the scientific and artistic funding system itself and another point I wanted to say when we said about how, um, how art science can develop differently and how, how artists can get a different freedom uh, in, evalu uh, in, in um, um, developing their experience, it's also they are working independently and scientists are bound to an institution and get their funding in a different way, so it's also uh, a question about how to bring together these two different funding necessities or, or funding structures you have. So you, on the one hand you've got artists working on themselves independently and I totally understand that how an artist works is, is, is the best way how to, uh, for them to work because they are going, uh, they, they are collaborating probably with many different institutions, scientists, and, and also have other um, things to do, like exhibiting their work, performing, and so on. So it's, so it's a completely different approach, so it's also dif difficult to how to frame this, actually. I wasn't expecting that this panel actually delivers results, but I think we, we have reached a point where this is at least some, some intermediate result here, which basically assesses the situation on the research funding side as problematic for art science funding in principle. I mean, I work a lot with in engineering, and I can only say that, of course, in engineering, it's a very goal-focused pro process uh, that is interested in achieving results quickly and reliably. And so this, this is why it's deliverable um, driven in a sense, right? But even in basic research today, I would say it's very difficult to come with a proposal that's entirely focused on a process. It is absolutely output oriented today. Maybe in the arts it's still different. I don't know. I don't know much about art funding, whether nowadays you have to already say what you're going to do or whether there is still money available for an interesting process. But, but I think as a result of this discussion, what we probably may need in the future is precisely that. It's something that is more interested in this, in this process-oriented view. Lucas, did you want to say something? No, no? good. Uh, sorry, yeah, Annick. Uh, I just want to add to, to, to what we, you said, but um, I think considering working on long term with research labs, it can be a whole um, institution or single labs and build residency not on um, uh, uh, 
outside calls, I would say, but work on long term with laboratories and, and we have examples in France. Um, I'm not saying it's wonderful, in, I mean, everything is not wonderful in the best world, but in the University Paris Sud, for instance, it's very small at the moment, but they are building things where some, some labs are um, ready to work with artists uh, on, on a, a multi-year, I mean, long-term project. So when you have to, okay, you go back to the funding, but um, CERN, in a way, is another example. Okay, it's not the best in the world also, but uh, establish connection with laboratories that uh, would uh, take maybe not every year, but every two years or whatever, but go, keep on getting artists. That's one thing. The second thing is in non-art science project, in art projects, you, artists get funded, okay, on an application. Of course, they say my output is going to be this and that. Sometimes it's just shit. The result is just shit. And nobody says, are we going to cancel the whole project? And the deliverable did not match whatever, and it didn't reach the entire world. No. We say, OK, we gave money to that artist, and the result is not what we expected it was. And end of the story, then we, we move on giving grants. So why is it that in art science, suddenly uh, we can't accept that sometimes there is non-interesting projects being produced and failures. Yeah. And this is something we have to teach our funders. Well, generally I'd say failures have become really rare in, in projects and programs. Actually, I don't know of any program that has been a failure, but uh, <laughs> at least not publicly. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I totally concur. And, uh, so I also think that uh, it should be much longer term, so not a residency, maybe even a permanent uh, positions for art science uh, uh, artists or art science researchers. Uh, part of that, I think that uh, the way scientists are being paid is also through uh, their education, because we also we teach a lot, of course. And uh, I th therefore, I also think that uh, there should be a part of the curriculum should be really directed towards art science or design art, design science. Uh, also in the sciences. Uh, we are actually trying this in Amsterdam uh, together with the uh, uh, Art Academy in Rotterdam. And uh, so just very gradually, just with, for a few credits, we're trying to build upon that and then to build really this new generation of uh, people that are much more broadly educated in research because I think that art science research is a very valid way of doing research. Uh, now it is different from the, from the multidisciplinary research or the monodisciplinary research from scientists, but I think it is a very valid research. And why not teach uh, students uh, that methodology as well? So I think that that would be, that would be I think, a way to go to have uh, a permanent uh, staff members in art science uh, that are also in, uh, part of the curriculum. Thank you. I think Evelina. So I just want to rewind a little bit uh, time to 1991. And there was an incredible event that you, that is totally impossible today. It was organized by the Stedelijk Museum. It was a four day debate between four major sectors of society. So there were artists, scientists, spiritual leaders, and uh, economists. And uh, it was a debate organized by the Stedelijk Museum to discuss the big challenges uh, that humanity is facing. Like the, the, they're looking at the crisis of our civilization, basically. And um, uh, it, it were really the, the top of their people from all disciplines, Dalai Lama, David Bohm, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, uh, CEOs of banks that had very little to contribute to this debate and their presentations are so, I mean, they're, they're, they were really embarrassing. This, this is available on YouTube, you can watch it. And uh, uh, so 
what we see now, and the, the, the challenges were the same, climate change, economic inequality, and so on. So I think this is also very important to look at it from this human point of view, where we have to find cohesion in society, where we have to talk to each other, and the way that banks and uh, the economic sector completely dropped out of this discussion, uh, I think uh, very much shows their, their a little bit uh, parasitic uh, attitude towards these challenges. And uh, um, I don't know about uh, uh, these religious sp spiritual leaders. It looks like this is also going a bit in the background, but scientists and artists are still trying to move ahead with these problematics. And although it's no longer attempted by major museums, uh, but I'm very ho hopeful that we're, we're still... How do we bring ba banks back into the discussion? Yeah. <laughs> Without them just letting pay it. Um, let, let's conclude this, this um, session um, with a question, obviously, for the future. I mean, where are you going? Where would you like to be going? Or how would you like to be funded in the future? You can either, either tell us uh, what the next steps are or, or what should be done. Um, I don't know, um, in, the, in the long run. Yeah, in the long run, obviously, we're all dead, but... <laughs> yeah, long-term funding would be necessary. So it's uh, really difficult, I think, for artists, especially for artists. I know scientists have the same pressure to, to get funding, and they have two years, three years, four years contract, but for artists, it's often even more difficult to proceed uh, with, a, with one project, maybe after one year. So it, it's really important to get a new funding system and a new, um, new idea of how these collaborations uh, and um, can develop. And so it's also, it's not only one, one person at a, or one artist at a specific uh, university. So uh, giving the freedom to collaborate with different universities or different, different scientific, scientific groups. Um, that's very necessary, yeah. I'll, I'll ask Speda first. <laughs> where, huh? where would you like to go in the future? Where will you be going? What and you can give a personal answer if you like. Personal answer. Uh, well, yeah, very, very personal. Um, there is a, sort of an opportunity to do a very interesting postdoc in Leiden. I'm probably jinxing it because we just submitted the pre-proposal now. Uh, but it's actually a collaborative project on the question of biotechnology uh, titled What Now? Uh, which refers actually to the, the deadlock, the philosophical deadlock uh, of, of these endless ethical debates um, with uh, arguments on both sides. So basically you do not know how to proceed. And um, it's a collaboration uh, between uh, philosophers and SDS scientists and artists to work on a common project together throughout the four years, like involved uh, continuously developing. And I think this is, on one hand, it answers the question of the longer term. Uh, on the other hand, I think this is crucial that the motivation for this um, cross-disciplinary collaboration is equal on all sides, so that we are all sort of invested and, of course, faced with innumerable conflicts and, and misunderstandings. Uh, which is probably the most productive uh, thing that can arise um, out of such a collaboration. So, keeping fingers crossed. Um, yeah, as I said before, I would go for um, institution. I can call it fit agency if you want. <laughs> Uh, but it can also be a starts agency, I don't care. Um, at least it has a structure um, that is reflected from the all st uh, stakeholders. 
uh, and that it serves the purpose. Um, I can say this as an artist, because artists will always be pathological, so we will always push collaborations or results or our laziness at the end, uh, no problem. Um, but until we don't have institution for that, we didn't succeed, I would say. Mark? Yeah, I was thinking about two things. One is um, more support for collaborative research um, and not just money for having workshops together, though of course that's obviously uh, useful to talk together, but really that, that really funds collaborative work and, and the formation of more collective actions and, and practice. Um, and then also um, funding for initiatives that spring up bottom up that are there already, uh, people doing interesting things, but that would need just a little bit more support. So in a way, idea of the startup, you could say, but then in, in this area. Um, and that, that I think that would also really help rather than always going through the old structures. Yeah, um, I hope that um, especially my study program, we start now with, with, uh, with 20 students. Next year we have 40 students and 24 months we have 60 students and now we have a bachelor. The next is a master degree and from now in five years time I think we will have, if they finally do their final degrees, the students, we will have a, a huge bunch of people who are educated in uh, cross-disciplinary education and who will have or were raised and educated with a certain awareness you just mentioned and uh, I hope that these people will probably um, be able to foster positive change. Um, well, I've, I'm trying to think about different angles to take on, on this. So the, the sort of the low level honest angle is kind of like I've struggled a lot with kind of especially with, I've been working on these two European projects, the Trust Me I'm an Artist project and the FEET project, and they've taken up so much of my time. And it's actually, as they, these projects are kind of coming to an end and, and, and putting up um, exhibitions and things from that, I got to a stage where I was like, actually, I don't have a project lined up, exactly something that I have to do. So, and then I got into this sort of real self-searching thing about what do I want to make next? What do I want to do? And one of the frustrations for me is that a lot of my collaborations automatically lead on to other ideas. And so, as I said, that I have all these scientists that I still want to continue working with, and we still want to work together. But there isn't a specific funding vehicle for or making that bit, making that bit. They always want something new, some different angle. So it doesn't support necessarily. I mean, you can go to things like the Arts Council in England to, to get funding like but it doesn't necessarily support those ways of working. So that's a bit of a struggle for me, which I'm trying to sort of think about and negotiate as well. Um, then, on the other hand, I'm thinking, because I, I have a big exhibition opening in Oxford on the 26th of September, if anyone's in town, uh, at the Museum of History of Science. And one of the other issues is where do you show this work? I mean, because there's always the situation where, yeah, you can come here and you can come and install something in a two-day, three-day, one-day turnaround, you know, something like that. But the show that I've been having in the museum, we've, the work's been installed for a month and it doesn't open until the 26th of September. I've got people adjusting the lighting, people preparing the texts and, and things now. And this is a very different way of working. So working with that very sensitive curatorial process, Process, um, over a period in close collaboration where you get to design the space perfectly for your work um, is a very different feeling. So I think to be able to work with institutions who can exhibit, like, I mean, museums and things like that, who can exhibit the work in a really interesting way, that's how you would like it to be seen, if that's how you would like it to be seen, obviously, um, would be something very important. And then in my most, like, maniacal, crazy moments, I think about, I founded years and years ago an artist group called the Institute of unnecessary research, um, and that's how we met, isn't it? Um, and and I would love to build it. 
I would love to have this institution where we could come and we could do this thing unnecessary research. Now, I don't know how well it translates if you're not a, a first language English speaker. Unnecessary doesn't mean useless, it just means not necessary. So it's like, um, it's all the things that go outside of the, the normal things that are considered to be the, the sort of the direct thing of research. So it's anything around that could be an aesthetics-led approach. It could be anything. And it could be just dropping that thing and then going off and doing that other thing because you want. That's unnecessary research. And I'd love to build it on an island. Thank you, Anna, which, which actually is, is basically what, what Spela Amia has asked for. Um, two words about the future. Um, while you're still here, please explore Ars Electronica and include the feet artists in your tour. Um, you will find them in different locations. Here in the exhibition, uh, Anna's work, um, uh, your work, Dimitri and Evelina, is in um, what's it called? Cyber the Cyber Arts Exhibition at OK. OK. Yeah, uh, and then continue to Ars Electronica Center to look at uh, Spela and Miha's work in the basement, if they're there. <laughs> um, but there's also another exhibition forthcoming at Bozar, uh, actually um, very soon, it's next week, which means there is a real issue of bringing the artworks from here to there, uh, but we'll hope uh, we'll manage. Otherwise, please join me in thanking the artists, um, and uh, I would also like to thank uh, the artists and the other panelists uh, for their contributions. It's been uh, a real privilege um, working with you on this project and, and also on the panel, obviously. Thank you very much.